Okay, continuing the build-up to the All-Ireland Senior Hurling Final this coming Sunday. It's Kilkenny against Limerick and uh, delighted to be joined by a Kilkenny legend in the esteemed Langton's Hotel as well, Eddie Kerr. Eddie, how are things? Great, Shane. How are you? I'm keeping well. Busy um, time. Busy. It's yeah. very busy. I, I, I presume the build-up and the hype to an All-Ireland Final week doesn't doesn't change the butterflies in the stomach whether you're playing or you're involved or not it, it's all the same if your county's there oh, absolutely yeah uh, the only problem is Shane at the moment there's so little time to build up you know it's a pity you won't go back to having uh, plenty of time you need three weeks at least if not four to get really savour the atmosphere but look it's the very same as you said before as it was before the butterflies are there whether you're playing or a supporter it's funny because even a lot of people before the semi-final, I guess, uh, you know, fancied Clare to maybe get get one over Kilkenny. But then again, when it's Kilkenny in a in a semi-final, you always expect to get the job done, I guess. Yeah, well, you know, the the spirit is there. You know, the spirit of of the Kilkenny team that has been there under Brian's time, you know, has been fantastic, uh, and it's con- under Derek it has continued on. So that spirit is there, and. We never give up hope, like no matter how the match is going. And that's the way it proved this year. We scraped through most of them, you know, the matches. But um, so we're hoping the same will happen Sunday. Absolutely. It's funny, we're in Langton's. I know it's a, it's a place steeped in, in Kenny Hurling history and, and the parties after after all Ireland wins and even defeats as well. Like I was chatting to uh, to Eamon Langton earlier and he was talking about his uncle Jim, yes. who would have played obviously years and years back for, for Kenny. And I think I'm right in saying it was yourself that uh, took his scoring record ultimately. I think I think Jim Langton at one stage might have held the scoring record, yeah, but no, you would have taken it off him. Yeah, well, Jim was actually, when I was growing up a young lad hurling, I wanted to be Jim Langton all the time. So he was, in my time, he was the hero, like you're talking about um, 47 not earned, I suppose, you know, was the win during that time and during all that period. He, he was the fellow I wanted to be when I grew up. So uh, Jim's name is legendary in Kilkenny. I'm sure you have a lot of people coming up to you and, and t- telling stories about how you were their inspiration. Uh, and I know that look, like six All-Irelands and I think it was five All-Stars as well. Mm. Like, how does it feel to be compared to, to players like Christy Ring and, and Mick Mackey and, and the, the, the true greats over the decades? It must, be, it must be nice now that you can look back on your career. You're not involved, you're not playing, you're not managing. So at least now you can almost take the plaudits, I guess. <laughs> It's lovely, actually, but you don't think... When you're playing, you don't think of these things. You just go out and everything's the next game. It's your training and your preparation. Uh, but as you say, as you get older, it's lovely to see your name mentioned with some of the players that you idolised and some of the players since my time that I idolise still, you know. So it's it's nice to be spoken in the same breath. It's funny, I was asking Fan Larkin and, and Joe Hennessy earlier, and Fan name check you in this... He, we were asking him, you know, the, the greatest player you ever played with and also the greatest player you ever played against. Like, do immediate names come to your head when, when you're asked those types of questions or, or is it more of a difficult one? I guess there are many options there. Yeah, like, we had such great teams. Like, I suppose my era was in the 60s and the 70s and there were such great players in the 60s, you know, that I had the honour of playing with and the likes of Fan uh, and, uh, you know, we played minor together and uh, we played at senior level then 63 and later on in, in the 70s so um, to go through all those teams now would be would be a, a, a task but every one of them played a major part in the the all Irelands we won particularly so um, yeah it's 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 great to look back you know and uh, um, and think of those players they're sort of they come back in the memory again particularly at our Ireland time those those six all Irelands, like is it like choosing between your your favorite children is there a, is there a favorite one in there i guess the first one will, all, will always stick with you 69 you captain the team yeah. so like are there any ones that in your mind you you go back there at the speed of thought as your favorite yeah well uh, as you mentioned 63 being the first one that all was sticks out there and as you say 69 when I had the honour of being captain as as uh, the Roar and the Steag, my club were county champions uh, in 68 so I got that I was given that terrific honour of being captain I suppose the best All-Ireland that I remember was probably 72 the tremendous game against Cork mm. and uh, we were 
sort of way behind Cork into the second half and they went seven points up and suddenly we got to grips with the game and got a run on them and we we won comfortably in the end but that as a game I suppose that one stands out It's funny you mentioned 1972 the same year Muhammad Ali comes to Dublin and he's involved in the famous bout at Krug Park Al Blue Lewis I think he was up yeah. against yeah. Uh, like I was in Las Vegas last last year with um, Gene Kilroy who was Ali's manager at the time okay but like famously you were uh i get was it tutoring muhammad ali in the, in the in the sport of hurling when he was in dublin yeah um my father now was a big boxing fan and we had bought tickets for the match and everything was in croke park as you know um but uh, i worked in the bank i was working in aib in, in in dublin at the time and i got a phone call from our pr manager bob ryan um, that Raymond Smith had been on to him. They were trying to do something different for to build up to the Muhammad Ali uh, fight, and we were we were in the All Ireland that time. So uh, R- Raymond Smith, uh, the late Raymond Smith, who was a journalist with the uh, with the Independent, um, got this idea that if he got me out as uh, a player uh, getting ready for an All Ireland final and to try and teach Muhammad Ali about hurling, so I couldn't believe what was happening to me because I used to get up and listen to the matches on radio or the boxing matches on radio with my father and here I was having a chance to actually meet he was of course Cassius Clay as you know Mm. he was in the beginning when he won the won the world championship so anyway um I it was out in um uh I can't remember the name of the hotel he was resident out there mm-hmm. it was out of dublin actually and uh, he was doing his training out there so i went out there anyway and i met um his manager at the time um and that name escapes me mm-hmm. as well and and he was out uh, muhammad ali was out running at the time doing jogging so uh, we were in the hotel bar and i had a great chat w- with his manager and and then the great man came in, you know, and he was in a tracksuit and started sweating. So I was introduced to him, which was amazing. Now, at that time, he wasn't the Muhammad Ali that we knew, you know, the boisterous. flamboyant yeah. boisterous. He was very quiet, you know, and sat quietly there. And he talked, he asked me about, uh, like he knew I was playing hurling and that, and he asked me about hurling and um, I, he said, I've seen that game, he said, on television. He said, that's a very dangerous game, he said. <laughs> and, and he looked at me to see, uh, you have no marks up, he said, you know. And you know the way he used to do his thing with, mm-hmm. uh, I'm pretty, I got no. But if, so he was doing that anyway. So anyway, we had a lovely chat and he, I was, he was interested in the hurling. So then uh, whoever came in to say, the press are outside now, you know. So uh, I had two um, Harleys and uh, a slitter and we went out and I was asked then to show him how to rise the ball and hit it and solo and stuff like that and he wasn't making a great fist of it, you know, (laughs) but uh, the press were there and they're taking photos and what have you and uh, the next time he came in close to me he said, uh, let's make a show for these guys, you know. So he got the hurl and he started trying to hit me with it, you know, and I was putting up my hurl and saving myself. So that was the day, really, and then I got him to sign a hurley. So I have that Still have framed. It. Yeah, uh, framed, actually, with a few pictures of the occasion. Brilliant. So it is, it is a great uh, talking point all the time, you know, and it, it was a very proud moment for me to meet him. That's incredible, especially when your father you got into boxing as well, yeah, you know, yeah. watching those fights, that's yeah, amazing. Yeah. But it's even like funny, Van Larkin was talking earlier to me about, uh, there, he was saying there isn't, there aren't enough hurls broken, broken these days, you know, in <laughs> matches, you can imagine fans saying that, but yeah, Muhammad yeah. Ali obviously was of a similar mindset, you know, yes, let's make yeah. a show here. Yes, a show, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he became the Muhammad Ali we knew from show business, I suppose, you know. Of course. So. Great guys. The, um, the, the, the first time you lined out in black and amber, and I mean at senior level, um, 1959, I think it was. So this is the, the, the replay game against Waterford. I don't even think you turned 18 at that point. No, like, what uh, are your memories of that one? Well, um, I had been, I played in three All-Ireland finals that year. The first one was the colleges with St. Kieran's, and we won that one. 
I was beaten in the minor all Ireland that year, and then the as you know the senior final was a draw. So it was sort of a downer at the time, but um, the replay was fixed, I think, for the 4th of October. And, you know, we're a bit down. Uh, and the next, that week, I think, after I got a phone call from Paddy Grace, the well-known secretary at the time, to say that I was selected for the panel. I couldn't believe my years. As you said, I was 17. I would have been 18 a month later. Uh, but um, so... I was told then that Ollie Welsh, famous goalkeeper, mm. who lived in Thomas and I was in Innistig, would collect me for training. And I mean, I just couldn't believe my eyes that, and my ears, that the great Ollie Welsh would be actually collecting me to go training. So anyway, I went into training and uh, the, you know, all the lads were sitting around, the heroes, you know, which was amazing. So. It was. I played two matches actually before that. I think it was an Oireachtas and something and another game played against Wexford uh, and against Dublin. My first game actually uh, was with Dublin in in Nolan Park, and um, one thing that stands out in me: we're playing Dublin and Des Foley, who was a famous Dublin footballer. Uh, and young, he made the Dublin team young in both hurling and football, mm. um, and uh, we would have come across them in colleges. But we were poking around at one end of the field in Dublin or at the other, and Des made the trotted up to me to wish me the best to look in the match, mm -hmm. which is my first. And I, I, I always think of that like how gracious he was, you know. Uh, so that was Des Foley from Dublin. So anyway, we played the two games. So. Come the All Ireland replay, then uh, there was a an injury in the replay to Johnny McGovern, who was left wing back, and they weren't sure whether he was going to make it or not. But mm. he was going to start, so I was told. Uh, Father Tommy Marr, who was the trainer of the team, came to me in the last day of training and said, "Be prepared to come in." He said, "We're not sure of Johnny McGovern, and if he goes off, uh, I'll be coming in in the forwards, of course." And I don't know who was going to move back to wing back mm. so that was the occasion anyway and it was in some ways it sort of passed me by uh, you know in this fierce occasion like but at the same time I do have one or two memories from it uh, other than the disappointment of being beaten but uh, I think I got two points in the second half but other than that was a disappointment. Yeah, not bad still for a couple of points for a, for a 17 year old in, in, in such a big game you mentioned in a steeg there like Growing up, I, I think I remember you talking before about games between the up streets and the down streets, which to, I guess to, to someone like myself, you could describe as the townies and the bog men in some ways. Yes, it, yes, it's a yes. soft way of putting it, maybe. Yeah, yeah. So that, these are the people from in, inside and outside the, the village, essentially. Yeah, uh, there was two. Uh, there was We had uh, uh, matches between the towns and the countries as well, but this one was between the up streets and the down streets. And it used to be always uh, played on some field in our territory. But I remember one of the up streets coming to me, to, to us then, and say, we're, we have a, we're, we want to arrange a match, but it's going to be up in the up streets, a field up uh, near Woodstock. And um, there was a debate. There was one fella who was fairly good, and he was sort of in between up streets and down street and the deal was that if we played up there he could play with us so we had a and and the other thing was there was a fellow called nick white who played in the local brass band and the big plus about this big game was that nick was going to referee the match but he was also going to play us around the field with the trumpet <laughs> so we walk around the field so there were great memories to have you know and and then, uh, other than that, we played on the square in front of the houses in in a steeg. You know, that was our mm -hmm. beginning of hurling, I suppose. The, and the name Father Tommy Marr came up there earlier, and it seems to be a name that's cropped up for me a lot today. It's chatting to people around Kilkenny, and it's almost like the Brian Cody before Brian Cody was a thing. Um, and someone, I know he was a teacher as well, and, mm -hmm. and probably would have brought a lot of his lessons and maths into yeah. Yeah. into his training, I guess. 
Yeah, I had him, of course, in St. Kieran's. Mm-hmm. He, he came in my second year into Kieran's. He was in Maynooth and then he was in Dublin for two years or something. But he was made dean in, in St. Kieran's in my second year. He was, uh, he was a maths teacher, so a lot of the maths did come into his thoughts on hurling. But he was the first person I, I ever met and uh, his legacy lives to the present day, I think who actually analysed the game of hurling, mm-hmm. you know, and all the skills, documented all the skills of hurling and methods of practising those skills. Mm-hmm. And he did all that with us at St. Kieran's and we won two. Uh, it was unusual for Leinster colleges to win the All-Ireland mm-hmm. colleges and he won two uh, colleges, All-Irelands with us in 57 and 59. And... Um, and then Paddy Grace, County Secretary that I mentioned before at the time, um, Paddy got the idea of bringing him to, to train the Kilkenny team. Mm-hmm. And they took a while to get used to him of his methods, like, mm-hmm. you know, uh, but it did happen. And like he was responsible for winning seven All-Irelands for Kilkenny subsequently, you know, uh, in the 50s, 60s and 70s, you know. So uh, he was the... F- uh, I know um, in the McVeigh wrote a book uh, it was called The Godfather of Hurling <laughs> and I thought it was a very appropriate name yeah because he was as you say ahead of mm. ahead of his time very much yeah. Fan Larkin said as well uh, and I think Joe Hennessy made this point earlier as well he, they were saying you were ahead of your time in terms of the sports science wasn't really a thing it wasn't you know you didn't have your nutritionists and all the rest <laughs> watching your diet but the lads used to say when the, when dinner would come out for a lot of the players, the desserts would come out and the lads would go wolf into them, whereas you might um, maybe pass over the dessert or, or certainly look after yourself a little bit more than, than other players. Was that always something that was that was in your head that you wanted? That your I guess your body was a temple if you were playing for your county. Well, I'd say they're only cotton there because they know <laughs> they know bloody well the desserts are my. Right. <laughs> and, I was the butt of that joke. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, no, I did. I was careful with my diet, I was certainly, but I, I, I liked the good things as well. But uh, I suppose I minded myself, I never drank alcohol and I trained, apart from the collective training, I did a good bit of training myself and, and you know, tried all the time. As I was getting weak on some skills, I went out and practiced them, you know, and, and I felt I was got, getting them right. So I did look after myself that way and I did mind myself. But I did eat the desserts too, yeah. yeah. What do you make of the game at the moment? Uh, the, the state of hurling, I guess, Eddie, because you, I was chatting with the lads today and you, you talk about Don Cusick's comments and promotion of the game, even different rules. You know, like Everyone's talking about the sweeper and the lighter slitter and all the rest. Um, is hurling in a good place at the moment, would you, would you feel? Yeah, the matches have been good. Now, you know, we, I suppose we found it very hard to get used to this modern game and the short game and the the short puck out and all this sort of stuff. I'm still not sold on it, to be honest with you. And there's a lot of things that are missing. They were, were there in our time, I suppose, in our game, you could call it. But still, the games are great. The skill level is mm. extraordinary. The fitness level is extraordinary. And, you know, I often think I'm never happy with a lot of the rules that are made uh, in the game. and. Of course, even the present thing about playing the All Ireland in August is a bugbear with me, or in uh, yeah, uh, in July I should mm-hmm. say. But um, despite all that, and I've seen it through the years, the hurlers are so good and so talented, they get over these changes they make despite I think <laughs> of what's done in Croke Park. So um, the game is in a good place. Um, it should be promoted more. Um, I know you do a tremendous job and off the ball. Uh, I think our national station should do a bit more on it. Um, you know, I, we, we should be very proud of what we have. You know, I remember growing up when, when I was young now in the 50s, nothing Irish was good. Like it had to be from Germany or England or Japan. And the only thing that we were proud of uh, and we could hold our head up is hurling it was unique and it was by far the best game to watch and i'm not sure if our national television and radio stations think that way at the moment like 
they promote other sports far more than our own sport. You know, even this week, you wouldn't know there was an All Ireland on yet. Mm. You know, the hype's been very quiet, hasn't it's it? Very quiet, and and like they should be proud. Like there's there's other things taking over other sports that are not Irish as such. You know, and I think we should show our pride in our own games, and we have the best game in the world without question in hurling and we should be proud of it and promote it I suppose there was the GEA go controversy if you want to call mm. it that during the summer as well but mm. I guess the thing is with the calendar now in both football and hurling there are so many games that the struggle is where do you put yeah. them and then of course they're behind a paywall and a lot of people are complaining that there's some brilliant hurling matches brilliant football yeah. matches behind a paywall this year and yeah. then there's the broadband problem you know <laughs> down the country the people some people maybe just can't physically no, watch it yeah it is a problem for a lot of people the ga go i probably see where it's coming from like mm. as you mentioned all the games but i'm really talking about um radio rt sport in the mornings there's everything except ga games mm-hmm. on it you know and uh, I, I think I think our national station and our national sports should be promoting. Uh, like they've hardly mentioned the All Ireland yet, and and why are we Wednesday? You know, uh, there's other things coming in to play. Uh, uh, it's a pity, but that's what's happening, unfortunately. Mm. So you know, I hope things will change. We we should ask you as you say we're we're Wednesday matches on Sunday. Uh, how do you see this one going, Eddie? Because I guess this great Limerick team going for four in a row, mm. it would be uh, quite a story if Kilkenny were the team to stop them getting four in a row. Given that oh six to oh nine, Kilkenny dynasty did just the same. Mm. Um, I mean, it feels like the gap has been narrowed from Limerick to the rest of the pack. Is this weekend the the weekend that Limerick are brought off their pedestal? Um, I don't know about that. Now, you have to admire Limerick. They're mm. a super team, as we admired the Kilkenny team of the noughties that won four in a row. But, you know, uh, when a team does that, everyone wants them to be beaten. Even our ri- I see some of our rival counties want us to win uh, this year, to, you know. But that's the way with it, and Limerick are well used to coping with that they have a super team that we all admire they have super hurlers they play a great game they have a great management team so like we can't take that away from them but we're here now Kilkenny are here they have the spirit Uh, you know we can see you know the spirit I suppose that was certainly there in Brian Cody's time has been carried on to amazing effect with Derek Ling and Peter Barry and Michael Rice and the team. Mm. So that spirit of never say die is there. So when Kilkenny are in an All-Ireland with that spirit of spirit in the team, we're always hopeful, you know. If Kilkenny, if uh, Tip or if uh, Limerick win their four in a row, we'll congratulate them, well played to them. But we'll be out. We won't be thinking of stopping them in a four in a row or anything like that. We'll be out as we always are if we're in All-Ireland, we're there to try and win it. Mm. And I think our lads will do very well and maybe steal it, you know, from them. Can Kenny buy a couple of points, that's what you're telling me. Yeah, that's it. Uh, well, they've won all their matches this year in the last minute and I'm hoping the same thing will happen, but not to give us the same heart attacks as, yeah. the, as they did for the other matches, yeah. I should ask you before we finish up, uh, TJ Reid, a man who's torn it up uh, in the scoring charts. I think I have your figure right here written down in front of me. Is it 35 goals and 336 points? I have written down there, but that, yeah. the scoring you did for Kilkenny was was off the charts, and TJ has just, I mean, notched up his own championship all time scoring record. So, I mean, what what sort of superlatives and words can you use about him now? I, I think they're all used. He's absolutely phenomenal player, and has been like I, obviously I've been watching him since donkey's years uh, at, at the various ages coming up. But he's a phenomenal player, and his attitude on the on the field, his reading of the game. Um, he always seems to be in the right place at the right time and, and knows what to do with the ball and that's just behind it other than that his skill level you know is phenomenal and he's just a joy to watch and like we are terribly proud of him that he's from Kilkenny and we've been terribly lucky like over the decades I suppose that we've had players like TJ and Eddie Brennan and um, uh, DJ Carey, Henry Shefflin, you know, we've been terribly lucky that we've had f- 
fantastic herders like that, uh, you know, Owen Larkin. Um, I, I could mention all the players again from the noughties that were so successful for us. But, you know, TJ is superb now and it's a joy to watch. Absolutely, well, uh, here's hoping from a Kilkenny perspective, I suppose he has another unbelievable game this weekend. Uh, Eddie, brilliant chatting to you and uh, enjoy the match this weekend. May the best team win, I suppose. That's all we can say, yeah, but uh, we're hoping that it's Kilkenny this time. Absolutely, great stuff, Eddie. Thanks, Thanks a million.